we're running a bit late. Please welcome Merlin Mann. I've been looking forward to this. Merlin, take it away. Thank you, Mike. Oh, mm, this isn't on yet, right? Anyway, so I says to her, I says, oh, hi, everybody. How's it going? Oh, excuse me. Oh, God. I had one of those sandwiches earlier. Um, no, seriously, the food's actually been really, really super good, don't you think? How's it going? You guys all right? You doing good? You having fun? No, I know. I'm used to this already. I've already had three talks where, like, everybody's super nice in New Zealand except when you talk, and they're just like... It's like I was, I was tempted to just kind of nudge people and make sure they were getting oxygen. I was a little worried. It's really nice to be here. Uh, I am pretty thoroughly convinced that uh, Chris Countryman has a different shaped head than I do because no matter what I do, this thing kind of wiggles. So, you know, I hope that's not, not distracting now that I've pointed it out to you. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Uh, this is intimidating. Does that surprise you at all? Uh, excuse me. Sorry. I beg your pardon. I'm terribly sorry. This thing made a, made a burping sound. I don't know if that's my fault. Uh, what do you think, Mac? I wonder why it's making that noise. Maybe I'll unplug this and see if it works. It's really nice to be here. Um, long story short, uh, <laughs> you hope. Um, Mike and Tosh uh, asked me to come to this thing, and I got this email. It's really a really random email. It's like, hey, come to New Zealand. It's going to be great. And then I, that's my New Zealand impersonation. And uh, I was like, yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah, I'll uh, just zip right over to New Zealand, which, you know, I'm here all the time anyway, so really I could just pop right in. Uh, but they were just so nice and so swell. And uh, this is going to surprise a lot of you, but I was really late getting them the description for my talk. And so they had to put that thing in about the mime thing. And uh, I had to come up with a, a uh, topic for my talk. And uh, I decided to go with the thing that I was most obsessed with right now, the thing that I was thinking the most about. And as I was literally pooping myself, uh, trying to think of what to call it, I went with scared shitless. Uh, oh, I apologize for the obscenity, but it was in kind of a rush. I uh, must have missed the spell check. But uh, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about being scared. Uh, I, I can talk for a really long time, and uh, I can speak a lot. I'm very comfortable doing that. But uh, I guess I, I should have checked the speaker lineup uh, before I'd been invited and committed to do it, because that's when I got scared shitless, big time. Uh, I'm not sandbagging. Like, it's really freaky. I honestly thought Mark Pilgrim was going to punch me in the mouth, because I've, I've joked about him over the years, because I'm kind of a little gay for him. And I, I, it's so weird to see your name on the same web page as these people that might as well be like, you know, uh, like constellations, you know? I'll be speaking after Orion the Hunter, and, and here I am, and that's really weird. Um, one thing that's great about our hosts, they do these, uh, they do everything so nice for us. They're just so good to us. And um, y'all got to see Amanda Palmer sing. Uh, you get to see her more. <laughs> also, let me note, it has been made very clear to me that I am all that stands between you and drinking, so I'm actually going to be really short. You may applaud. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's called pandering. I think I just stole someone's joke. But we, at the speaker dinner, Amanda Palmer totally gets up and starts playing the ukulele, and she played this song that made everybody laugh. I know you guys, you, uh, you guys have heard the song now, too, but uh, I think we all laughed a little bit uncomfortably because I'm pretty persuaded that we all kind of feel like we don't belong here. Uh, I don't know anybody here who's not a little bit scared about being here. It's really intimidating. And look at you guys. You're barely moving. It's like Madame Tussaud. But no, seriously, everybody I know is sitting there. You should be back in the green room. It's, it's ridiculous. It's like... I don't know. It's, it's like there's going to be a hanging or something. People are very concerned, and keynote is open. There's a lot of people perspiring, and I thought Tom Coates was going to have some kind of a conniption, but uh, his slides probably turned out okay, I'm, I'm guessing. I, uh, I don't know if you follow any of the BS I do, but I, 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 so much of what I end up talking about ends up coming back to fear on some level, which is weird because I'm really uh, totally fucking scared of everything. Uh, like really like a lot, a lot, like a lot of things I'm scared. I've always been scared. I'll always be scared. I'm scared right now. I'm just talking a lot so you can't tell. But I think fear is a really big thing. I talk about it a lot because I think it's something that ends up affecting a lot of our decisions and the way we see things. And uh, I uh, want to tell you some things I'm scared about, some things I have been scared about. Oh, I know what you're thinking. 
You're Dan Benjamin, right? You're, uh, <laughs> that's fine for Merlin. Guy. Everybody, Merlin, that's fine for you, Merlin. Why are you scared? You're the biggest douche on the internet. What do you have to be scared of? Oh, gosh, where do I begin? Where do I begin? Well, let's start. Let's see. What's a good one to start with? Um, I haven't always been this athletic. Um, I haven't always been this um, ripped. 1978. Doyle Murphy. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of James Dickey. Uh, if the two guys from Deliverance had intercourse in the butt and uh, had a child, that's what Doyle would look like, except he was just made of pure muscle. He looked like he was carved out of a chestnut tree, a uh, chestnut tree, and, and like, you know, and, and, and he had been held back, I think, for about 16 years, and he was terrifying. He was very, very strong. He was very hard. I'd bumped against him in the locker room and, and I'd been bruised, and he just had a, he was just scary as all hell, and he was our bully. Every school has one. In the United States, I mean, a lot of the subsidies for this have gone away since then, but back then every school got a bully, and uh, he was terrifying. I was scared shitless of Doyle, um, and I never actually had a problem with him, but, but boy, he sure kept, <laughs> kept all of us uh, non-athletic types in line. Uh, truly, truly. I mean, seriously, he was like 35. I don't know why he was even in school. It was kind of odd. My first job, uh, you've heard me talk about this on, on Benjamin's show, uh, was this uh, company in Florida uh, where I work with Dave, the uh, marketing guy. <sighs> if you've heard about Dave, the marketing guy, this was that job. And Rob was the guy who ran the place. Uh, Rob also sandwiched. This is the guy that would pick his butt and put his finger in up to the second knuckle. This is Rob. Uh, he, oh, it's my fault? Okay. <sighs> I was making the grand sum of $22,000 a year, and I was terrified of this guy because I didn't want to lose that kind of dough. Um, he called me Mr. Magoo because he didn't like the way that I drive, and eventually I got fired uh, for using the internet too much at work. So that fear panned out pretty well. Uh, 1972, uh, WXIX, Cincinnati, Ohio, there's a character named the Cool Ghoul. So everybody's got like, you know, you got your million dollar movie, you got your creature feature. The Cool Ghoul was the guy who hosted our, our creature feature. And he was actually this local guy, my dad knew him, from, from broadcast stuff in Cincinnati. It's a small community, everybody knows each other. Yeah, we do know uh, George and Nick Clooney. Ask me later. But um, nice guys. And uh, anyway, the cool ghoul was this guy, and he had these crazy, do this, he had these big black eyes, all this makeup, and scared the living shit out of me. And I, when I walk around with my dad in our apartment complex, there'd be this little culvert in your face, Chris Countryman. I will get you. There's this little culvert down this hill where like, it was like this little crappy creek. And my dad would say, You know, that's where the cool ghoul lives. And he thought it was hilarious. I was scared shitless. Truly, well and truly scared shitless. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember this. Uh, you, I don't know if y'all remember Fats. Um, circa, actually I don't think we have audio on this. So I don't know if you'll be able to hear it. Uh, circa 1979, I'm uh, being, uh, staying with some friends while my mom's out of town. Um, anybody remember a little Anthony Hopkins movie called Magic? I don't know if you remember Abracadabra, I sit on his knee. Presto, change and now he is me. Focus, focus, we take her to bed. Magic is free. We're dead. So that's Fats. Uh, I was alone on the second floor of the Davidson House in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I didn't sleep for three nights. Did you guys want me to show that again? Would that? Yeah, me neither. Uh, 1980, Kismet Abbey, eighth grade. Uh, I asked her to go to the Congress skating rink with me. Uh, it took me probably two weeks. She was like this big. I mean, like she, was, she was like made out of a shampoo bottle. She was tiny. And she had really cool little hoodles, that funny hair. She had like, like miles and miles of braces. And in the night, I said, getting this weekend journey. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, she, I mean, she inclined her head a little bit. And she went, I have to do something with my family this weekend. And I went, boop. And my Pac-Man died. I was so, and then I was just, it was the first time I'd ever legitimately tried to ask a girl to do anything. And it was the beginning of a lot of, you know, really unsuccessful things. And then I had to sit next to her in English class uh, for the rest of the year. So that wasn't great. Uh, I courted a woman in college. I followed her around. I played in bands with her. And I eventually got her to marry me. And I was a real shit heel. She divorced me. I didn't even see it coming. Had no fucking idea that I was getting divorced. And when she divorced me, 
I was so scared. You have no idea. I thought my life was over. How could I possibly do this? I was, this is the kind of divorce. Now, if you guys, some of you have been divorced. You know there's the kind of divorce where you go, oh, man, I see that coming. I did not. It was like, it was like a sock full of pennies in the back of the head. Uh, I listened to, I don't want to minimize this. I was a fucking wreck. I mean, for three weeks, I just drank a 12-pack a day of uh, uh, bush, if you're curious, and uh, just listened to the Afghan Whigs gentleman on repeat. And I pulled it together eventually, but uh, it was hard. It was really hard. It's funny how these things can come along when you feel like you're a grown-up, and suddenly, even though you're a grown-up, you really feel like the rug's been torn out from under you. And all the stuff you do to prepare... It's for not. You're never really ready. You're never really ready. So I got a job and I moved to California. And I met a woman. And I thought, what the fuck are you thinking? No way are you going to go and meet somebody that soon. What is wrong with you? And I was scared. What is wrong with you? You're supposed to go out and have intercourse with cute Asian girls with expensive shoes. This is what you promised yourself. (laughs) You're going to go see pavement with Korean girls who go to the Art Institute with big black glasses, and you're going to have really funky sex and, like, not understand a lot of what they say, and they're going to have really cool underwear. (laughs) And instead, I started making out in a bar with a woman at a Thinking Fellows show. Three weeks later, she moved in, and now she's my wife. And I was so fucking scared because I thought, what am I going to do with this woman? I always knew in the abstract that I wanted to have a kid, right? In the same way that, like, you want to get a Mustang. <laughs> Who doesn't want a 65 Mustang, right? You're going to turn it down, you know? It's like uh, turning down a hand job or a Coke. Like, nobody does that. <clears throat> put it off, put it off, put it off. The aforementioned Madeline starts going tick-tock, tick-tock. I, I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was alcohol or a bad day, but we did it, and I was so scared at every single step of the way. I'm not milking this, you guys. I was so fucking scared, and I'm still so fucking scared. But now I'm scared because, like, I don't know what would happen if I hadn't done that. (sighs) Nobody wanted to tell me my dad was sick, but I knew. You can tell. The hospital bed in the living room is a giveaway. And uh, I thought I would never come back from that. I thought that was it. Um, There's no way, right? How do you do that? It's half your life, gone. Never going to be the same. Um, I was really scared of that. I'm pretty scared of me. I don't know where I'm going. I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. I took these pictures of these index cards in the parking lot earlier today. They're kind of out of focus. <laughs> I got the inbox zero thing on here if you guys want to see it. I'm pretty good at that one. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. I have no idea. Uh, uh, I came out here and they, uh, do some talks, do some workshops. And I'm just sitting there in front of all these people who are way smarter than me with jobs going, uh, innovation, sailboats, and just going like, what am I thinking? What in the hell am I thinking? Ah, I I just want to stipulate, I'm still incredibly fucking scared. I don't know what is going on with me. And as for you, sorry bastards, look at you. You paid money to come here. I was explaining to my friend Frank that I'm an artist, as you can tell. uh, I'm up here just just slapping together index cards, but out here there's like these people who are just these mind-blowingly great, doing great slides. (laughs) This is not an asshole, this is a MySQL joke. I'm scared of everything all the time. (laughs) Inclusive. It's not a but. It's not funny. Butts aren't funny. I was back there getting ready. Uh, Listen, uh, my douchey information phone, listen to music. And I thought I needed more slides than I had, so I uh, put in a few more. Um, Some heroes of mine. Because I was sitting there, and I, I was listening... Uh, to some songs, and these are actual songs that I was listening to. And uh, I started thinking about other people who've had to deal with being scared of stuff. 
People have really overinflated what it meant when Bob Dylan first started playing electric live. Um, there's a lot of mythology around Bob Dylan, some of it interesting, some of it not. But the truth is, <laughs> he could have had a really lucrative living for a pretty long time just sitting around, you know, singing folk songs, and he didn't. He got, you know, the Hawks, you know, Robbie Robertson and his band together. Uh, and he played some really, really shitty rock music in front of angry English people. Have you ever heard it? Have you ever heard what it sounded like? People were not happy. Pete Seeger wanted to unplug him, and he's got thin bones. <laughs> Man was scared. He had the world on a string, but he just kept pushing it, kept trying different things. 34-year-old school teacher from Dayton, Ohio, could have just kept showing up for school a little bit hungover, and instead he made one of my favorite albums of all time and went on to just produce album after album of some of the best stuff, and then album after album after album of a lot of stuff that I could kind of take or leave, but Guided by Voices is one of my favorite bands. If he hadn't had the, the stones to say, well, maybe it's time for me to stop being a school teacher and go be a rock star, we'd be the worst for wear. And the big story, this one's for Mike. Nobody, nobody was under more pressure than the boss. He was about to be dropped from his label after making two of the best rock albums of our generation, of, of really the rock era. But they weren't selling. You know, they're real talky kind of, you know, kind of post-Dylan talky albums. They weren't going anywhere. They put the hype machine in place, put the pedal to the metal. Come on, Bruce, you got to get this Born to Run record out. You got to sell it. You're the new Dylan. You're the new Dylan. You're, how would you guys like to be the new Dylan? You feel up to that today? He had dozens of versions of just a Thunder Road alone. He spent we went way over time and budget. He would start over, he would throw out the tracks. There's a documentary about this that has a little bit of hagiography to it, but the basic story is true. Why is this meaningful to me? Ask me in a few weeks. He was under a fuck ton of pressure to put something out that he didn't think was ready yet. And he didn't do it. Even though he was probably pretty scared. People were all scared shitless at one time or another. Those are heroes, but I got a few way bigger heroes. I got a hero who helped me with my book. Best notes I've gotten yet on my book. I got a hero uh, I follow on Tumblr, who I think is one of the most inspiring people I know, and uh, one whose blog post is the basis for my favorite thing I wrote last year. There's somebody uh, out there who I think is probably doing the music game better than just about anybody right now. Certainly finding her own path, doing her own thing in a way that I think is just really instructive and uh, really, a word I don't love to use, she's really inspiring. A woman I, I've argued with on at least four occasions here because I still don't understand how she does her job without making everyone hate her. <laughs> but she does. And it's not just because she's charming. It's because she's really smart, and she's not only smart enough to know how the Dom works, but she's smart enough to explain it to me, which was really helpful, and I'm still kind of confused, so I'll probably want to round back around to that. Boy, a guy that just always brings the room down. I saw him at Deconstruct, and holy shit. Amazing, amazing guy. 43 folder started because I used to eat lunch with this guy. I used to sit around with him, and, and, and we'd sit there and eat kebabs at the Adaptive Path office, and I'd tell him, at length about this thing called Quicksilver. And we go on and on and on <laughs> and on and on. And where all my other friends said, you should get a fucking weblog, um, Doug very politely would say, you know, Merlin, you should get a website and talk about this in his very Doug-like way. And I said, you know, Doug, it's a very interesting idea. Let me let you get back to work. Boy, somebody, somebody that I think is just pretty cool. Um, and somebody uh, like talking about kids with, somebody who I think is just one of the biggest smarty pants around, incredibly inspiring to me. I forget who this is. I've got to check the name on this. Huh, not ringing a bell. The best writer I've ever met. He was serious. It's true. It's actually true. 
And he wrote that on a card while he was putting his presentation together and handed it to me and said, you can use this. Stones. Somebody I've wanted to meet for 10 years. Scared, shitless. Scared, 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 scared. Do you guys ever get scared? Probably not. Not really. What's to be scared of, right? Or are you actually like all of these other people and uh, sometimes occasionally even driven by all that fear until it fucks you up inside and you're not even sure what's real anymore and you're trying so hard to protect all those little wounds and perceived wounds that you just kind of stop doing cool stuff because you're scared. I do. I need to be reminded. I need to listen to this talk. Cut out the parts where I cry like a big jerk. But it's true. Everybody's scared. In retrospect, I'll bet Doyle was scared. He probably didn't like being held back a bunch and being really goofy looking. Right? The cool ghoul, he probably didn't want to be a ghoul. <laughs> Who knows? Nobody likes being scared. Last thing you expected uh, at Webstock was a quote from the GoDaddy guy. This is one of the greatest quotes of all time. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. I've done three gigs at GoDaddy. They're a good client. Um, but uh, that guy's insane. He's off his nut. He's completely insane. <laughs> He's got crazy eyes. <laughs> but in this uh, kind of famous blog post, uh, he talks about basically his rules for life. You know, I think he finally realized it was kind of a gravy boat, so he's dressed it up a lot over the years. But he tells a story about his, his dad saying to him, you know, Bob, they can't eat you. I find that so pathetically, sadly, tragically comforting. I mean, you know, I, I like suddenly last summer as much as the next guy, but I honestly don't think that anybody's actually going to mix me up with ranch dressing and eat me, I'm pretty sure. You know? They can't eat you. No matter how much you fuck up, no matter how many, time, how many stupid things you do, no matter how many dumb blog posts you make, no matter whatever you do, like, they're, they're pretty much, pretty definitely not going to eat you. They can't eat you. They won't eat you. What's the worst thing you can imagine happening? I don't know. I, I sure wouldn't want to be eaten, that's for sure. I think it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> I had this period where I listened to OK Computer a lot on repeat, not, not which the song is not from, but um, I found myself listening to it a lot, and I'd go and I'd read reviews and read Wikipedia, and uh, Tom York regards that as his really, like, upbeat album. <laughs> the, the one with no surprises on it uh, is, his, is his, really, his really upbeat one. But boy, I think Amanda really nailed it. Boy, don't we all kind of walking around wonder if we're a creep and a weirdo? And if we belong here at all? I know I do. But I think you do. I think you all do. I think uh, at the risk of repeating the biggest cliche in the world, everybody's scared. And the only difference is whether you're just going to keep making stuff when you're scared and whether you're going to keep doing stuff when you're scared because you're always going to be scared. It's always going to be there. But they can't eat you. It's very unlikely to happen. Now, here's the uh, typically Merlin-like um, mixed ending for you. I love my ex-wife. She was great. But if she hadn't divorced me, I would have met my wife. If my boss hadn't fired me for using the internet, I wouldn't have started making web page, pages. If I hadn't started making web pages, I wouldn't have made shitty web pages for 10 years before I got to move to California. There's all kinds of stuff that just starts in total shit that can turn into pretty good stuff. And just because you're scared of it, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Stuff's going to happen. The universe doesn't care whether you're scared. You're kind of screwed on that point. But it's my belief that if you keep running, I always like to say, if you run through the shit storm, let yourself get covered with shit, but keep running, you'd be amazed how scared you can be and still do it. Because nobody eats you yet. I don't see any forks or anything. You might eat me, I'm not sure. But it's true. It's absolutely true. And everybody you admire, everybody you respect, everybody you like, 
they all sit around and wonder if it's, they're going to be able to repeat it again from day to day. They wonder if they're just going to start to suck or if they already suck. Everybody worries about that. Everybody. Everybody's scared. I know this is not news, but you need to hear this. I'm scared. You're scared. And we're all scared. The difference is whether you're going to keep moving. And I really hope you will. I hope you keep moving. I hope you keep making cool stuff. I'm going to let you guys go in just a minute. First, I'm going to do something really dorky. Everybody I called out on the uh, cards, Tom, David, Tosh, anybody here? Anybody here whose name was on the cards? Come up here. Michael, anybody else? Lop, get up here. Don't be a jerk, get up here. Christina, <laughs> Doug, Tosh. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can trade. I think you, guys, you might want an iPod. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Look at these guys. Did you guys like these guys? Did you like these presentations? Did you see what these guys did? Did you see it? Thanks. 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 It's pretty amazing. The people, thank you. Wow, for people, for people that were that scared, they did some pretty cool stuff, don't you think? What are you guys going to do? You going to keep doing stuff even though you're scared? These are for you. As promised, I will not stand behind you between you and your drinking. I won't do that. I wouldn't do that to such a wonderful company. But I do hope you're a little less scared. And I hope, really hope you've had the same good time that I have had here. Uh, I haven't told my wife yet, but we will be moving here. I went and got espresso this morning and they were playing Whiskey, Whiskey in the Jar by Thin Lizzy really, really loud. And it was good coffee. You guys got a great thing. And uh, it's been an extraordinary honor to just be around you guys and to be scared shitless by your presence. Thanks very much. Hello. How are you? You want this?